Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we will begin in just a few minutes. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very excited to kick off our webinar series, AEC Collection Essentials today. And this presentation is a discussion uh, of conceptual design workflows using Formit in the AEC Collection. My name is David Smolker, and I'm a product marketer at Autodesk, and I'm coming to you live from my home office in the great state of California. Like all of you, we here at Autodesk have been adjusting to the new reality of a world of COVID-19 quarantine and safe distancing. So we understand some of the challenges of working from home. Please know that if your grocery delivery arrives, your kid has a meltdown, your parents or grandparents need help using their phones or anything else, we are recording this presentation so you can catch up on anything you missed. Before, because I get this, I get this question a lot, let me clarify that the hanging dolls above and behind me are from Mexico and they include cats, cows, dragons, and assorted other creatures. So welcome to my home. So without further ado, Again, thank you for joining. And before we get into the workflows, I'm going to walk you through some light housekeeping. So the audio settings for today's webinar uh, are supported through your computer speaker system. If at any time you experience audio issues, please try refreshing your browser, switching browsers. Uh, you can submit questions throughout the presentation. We've got a cadre of talented BIM and format experts on the line to answer them in real time. Uh, and we will also answer them at a Q&A portion at the end of this presentation. And as I mentioned before, uh, we're recording this webinar and we'll be sending it to you out via email after the event. So a quick moment of safe harbor before we get into the presentation and make some introductions. Uh, this presentation may make statements regarding future events and development efforts for our products and services. These statements reflect our current expectations based on what we know today. Our plans are not intended to be a promise or guarantee of future delivery of products, services, or features, and purchasing decisions should not be made based upon these statements. Now, with that out of the way, I want to introduce our co-hosts for today's event. Uh, on the line today, we have a talented group of BIM AEC informant experts, including senior product owner Josh Goldstein, Daniel Wood, who is a technical sales specialist for the AEC at Autodesk, and Scott Davis, who's not pictured here, but Scott is a senior AEC technical sales specialist as well. And now to take us through our agenda for today, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Formit product manager, Heather Leck. Great, thanks, David. Let me take control of this 
Uh, okay, actually, I'm going to leave it for you. Okay, so thank you, and thanks to all the customers out there who are attending live. Um, as David mentioned earlier, please remember to use the questions panel, and we'll try to get your questions answered in real time again by Josh, Daniel, and Scott. Um, so during the next hour, I'm going to take you through a complete conceptual design workflow that features Format Pro and connects it with workflows involving other AEC collection products. I'll focus on workflows that combine Format Pro with InfraWorks for 3D context, with Insight for solar and energy analysis, and with Dynamo for computational design exploration. Each of the teaching segments will be just about 10 minutes long. Additionally, we want to hear from you, our live audience. So we'll run four live polls interspersed between the teaching segments. I hope at the end of this, you have a renewed excitement around early stage design modeling and are ready to take your design to the next level with all of what the AEC collection has to offer. And with that, um, I'm gonna send it back to David to kick off our first poll. Yes, so let's kick off our first poll. And the, the first poll question we have for you today, if we can pull that up. Uh, so the poll we have today, as you can see on the screen here, is how familiar are you with the AEC collection? Uh, the options, we use the AEC collection. Uh, sorry, I'm having trouble reading my panel here. We use the AEC collection. Uh, option two, have heard of it, but don't use it. Option three, haven't heard of it, but we use Autodesk products. And option four, haven't heard of it, and we don't use Autodesk products. So as those responses come in, take a moment to get the temperature. All right, we have a lot of folks who are familiar and use the AC collection, so that's great. Uh, this is this is the right uh, this is the right webinar for you. We're really going to focus on conceptual design today and talk about how using the AC collection you can really get a lot out of Formit and out of your early stage conceptual design processes. Um, as we go along here, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the AC collection now. Uh, and talk a little bit about this webinar series. As I mentioned, this is the first in our AEC Essentials webinar series, and it's a look at, a look at multi product workflows through the lens of outcome based design. The AEC collection provides designers, engineers, and contractors a set of BIM and CAD tools that support projects from early stage design through to construction. This is the first in our series, as I mentioned, and dates for future installments you should keep in mind include generative design in Revit in September and complete bridge design workflows coming in just a few weeks in August. Be sure to check out our registration page and register for our upcoming sessions. We'll be showing that registration page at the end with a link to where you can register and find out more. Um, and before we kick it over to Heather to talk about the value of Formit for early stage design, I wanna talk a little bit about how we think about uh, achieving design and engineering outcomes through the AEC collection. At Autodesk, we think of our products as assisting and helping you achieve better design and engineering outcomes. So whether the value drivers improve sustainability, greater risk reduction and operational efficiency, or the growth of a firm's business through client satisfaction and improved design quality, the tools you use should be considered in terms of how they help you achieve these outcomes. Today, we're presenting Formit as the central engine for conceptual design workflows and taking you through how InfraWorks can be used to better understand your site in 3D and locational context, how Insight can inform building performance through energy and solar analysis before you even talk to a systems engineer, and how through rapid design and rapid iteration with, with Dynamo, you can begin to test your design ideas. When these workflows come together, we see better outcomes forming, like more environmentally friendly design and better building performance, the ability to reduce risk by limiting errors and rework as you move through conceptual design into design development, and ultimately meeting the customer and design requirements that will improve client satisfaction design and design quality. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Heather to tell us more about the role of Formit in early stage design and to set the stage for our focus areas today. Great, thanks David. So um, before we get into the teaching segments, I'm going to review the value of Formit Pro in the AEC collection. And there are many benefits of using Formit Pro. I'm going to touch on five highlights today. First, Formit allows you to start simple and add complexity as needed. Formit's an intuitive solid modeling tool, and I'll touch on some of the basic 3D tech sketching techniques in the webinar today. But uh, know that there are many more advanced modeling tools in Formit that handle Boolean operations, shelling solids, repairing and extending forms, and much more. 
And David, if you could advance the slide just on one, great. Um, second, it leverages location data for environmental and sustainable analysis. The importance of setting a location format is probably the number one thing I want you to come away with from this webinar. It gives you access to all types of analysis. And today I'll show you two methods for setting the location and show three ways to analyze your building and site design. So third, Format Pro is a unique combination of dynamo computation and direct manipulation. In this webinar, I'm gonna walk you through setting up a workflow using a dynamo graph to explore design options for a facade study. Um, this is an area of investment for Autodesk and specifically the Format team. We're investing in a more learnable approach to dynamo and we're also investing in a data-driven approach for outcome-based design. Um, the fourth value, Format directly connects to Revit with less rework. So unlike other conceptual modeling tools, Format's levels, um, groups, categories, and materials all transfer to Revit with no rework. Uh, the Format Revit connection is an area of significant investment, again, for Autodesk and the Format team and also the Revit team. And we're committed to providing a more efficient translation from early stage design to detailed design with a linking workflow, because we understand that your design process is iterative, it's not linear. Um, I'm not gonna cover too much about the Format Revit workflow in this webinar, because it's really a whole webinar in itself, but know that it's an area of investment for Autodesk and also within the, um, the handout, you'll see some uh, links to more, more more um, information about that Format Revit connection. Um, and finally, the last value, with Format you can share data anywhere at any time. And we're doing this in a few ways. First, you can take advantage of the Autodesk ecosystem to save, share, view and track models on BIM 360 docs for project coordination. Additionally, Format has a multi-user environment. It also runs on three platforms. So you can use it on the iPad, the web, and Windows desktop. And this makes it really easy to work on the go, say from a job site or from the client's office, and then jump right back into the model on your desktop computer when you get back to your, your office. Uh, so Format Pro is a great complement to the AEC collection products that you're already using. And in this webinar, I'm gonna focus on those first three value points. Um, and with that, what I'm gonna do is onto the workflows, as it says. So I'm gonna take control of the screen, make myself a presenter, um, move this. And so you should be seeing my format screen now. And so what I'm gonna do in this first segment is talk about setting the location and also uh, bringing 3D context in. So I mentioned I'm gonna do a full um, sort of workflow of conceptual design throughout this webinar. So what we have here is a, it's a real location, it's in Denver, Colorado, and we're gonna focus on this sort of L-shaped site right here. And we're gonna look at some designs for a mixed use building and a pedestrian plaza on this site. Um, and this is actually a real real location and site that um, my colleague Josh has been working on. So we thank him for the idea and for some of the models as well. Um, but it's really like sort of a revitalization of a downtown area and we're trying to, um, get a nice design here that will complement the area around it. So this is where we'll end at the end of this segment, but first I'm gonna go back and, and start with a blank Revit, temp, Revit file, which is how you would start your, your projects. And up here on the ribbon, I have a location um, button that I'm gonna click right there. And I can start by typing in an address. Now I have the specific address here, so I'm just gonna click on that. But if I don't, I can type in Boston, I can type in California, and it will take me to that area. Um, in this case, I know the exact address. So I'm looking at it here. This is um, information coming through Bing Maps. And it's this L-shaped site right here that I'm interested in. Um, and if I zoom out, you'll see that I get a lot more information and I can see this, this weather station data. These are real weather stations. And I, they'll show me dry bulb temperatures. They'll also show me windrows diagrams um, that can really help me just really early on when I'm looking at site feasibility. I'm gonna zoom back into my site here um, and show you that another thing I can do is import satellite image at this point. 
So I can click on this and I can zoom in and out, pick which area of the site I want to bring into my format model, and then I can click finish importing. And what that would do is bring in a two-dimensional image of this site. And that's a very valu valuable way to bring in um, site data. But for this, uh, I'm gonna show you a different way of bringing in site. So in this case, I'm just gonna go back to this dialogue and hit set location only. And then I'm gonna switch over to InfraWorks, which I have up and running here. And InfraWorks, of course, comes in the AEC collections. And I'm gonna click on this button called Model Builder and type this same address in, in this location here. And it's, again, gonna zoom me right into the same the same um, location again this l-shaped site with this small building on it and i could say i would click on create model here so i've already done this if i hadn't already done this um because i'm signed in to my autodesk account it will email me in about it maybe takes about 10 minutes to generate the model now i've already got the model again so i'm just going to click here and open up that model and i can see that it brought in um it brought in building data, it brought in roadway data, and it also brought in um, 3D terrain. And this is really, so what I'm gonna do with this, and I'm gonna show you this now, is I just um, go to present share, and I'm gonna choose to export this model. And I'm really only, I'm exporting this as an FBX, so you can think of this as just one way to bring, um, bring data in the form of FBX into your format model, but this data could also be coming from other um, other products. So in here, I, I generally say use the entire model. Again, I choose that FBX, make sure it's an FBX format. format. And then for options, I like to ex export materials and textures so that I have the material mappings of my buildings. And then I merge objects with the same texture. And that, again, that's just to, um, reduce file size and make the, the file a little um, snappier inside of format. So I'm going to click cancel, but you would you would click export that there. And then back in my format model, I click on the file button and say import locally. I could do this if the file was saved on BIM 360 docs, I could also access it that way. In this case, I have it locally. So I just click on that FBX and I bring it into my model. Um, and I've already brought it in here, and you'll see that if I select this, it's sort of one, um, it comes in as one object. And it's, when you, when it will, when it initially comes in, it's actually going to come in at the elevation of the actual city of Denver. So it's high up 5,000 something feet, right, for it's a month, the mile high city. And then what I do is I bring it, um, I bring it down to the model plane inside of um, format. And that I've just found makes it easier for, for my modeling tools. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is this north arrow in the bottom left here. And that, uh, I turn that on just to assure that it truly did come in oriented correctly. Um, and the way you turn that north arrow on and off is over on the right hand side here, this little sunglasses or visual styles panel. If I click on the third button over, I can toggle that north arrow on and off. And I generally like to leave it on. It might be off by default in your, in your file though. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is, you'll see that I have this work plane, this grid of a work plane on my site, but it's not oriented nicely with the orientation of my site. And if I want to um, be modeling in here and using some snapping tools, then I wanna reorient that grid um, to the correct orientation of my site and what i'm going to do is right click on the outside um, outside of my model here and this is how it always uh, takes a minute to come up here there we go so i right click and i get this um in this um curse on my cursor i get this button called set axes and I like to zoom in, I kind of eyeball this, you don't have to be that precise, but I um, snap it sort of over here to the corner, and then I can drag one of the axes so that it's um, more somewhat orthogonal to my site here, and just double click. And that's gonna, again, reset my grid, my work plane grid to, to my site orientation. So that's 
really how I set up my model. Again, I set the location and I bring in some 3D context. And again, this file um, or this, this information is really just an FBX. So you can imagine also, let's say you had a Revit model that you wanted to use for context, export that as FBX, bring it right in here. Um, or you could also bring other file formats like DWG in directly here, directly into format. Um, and with that, we're really ready to start our conceptual massing design on this site. And for that, I'm, actually, I'm gonna switch to a video because um, I don't want I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about 3D sketching in this webinar, but um, we do have a lot of links in the handout that will give you a lot more information. But I'm going to go over the basics with you now. So Formit is a a 3D it's, it's a solid modeling tool, which means that I create extrusions and I can push and pull um, forms and what I've done here is sort of created a few forms to start with. I created some windows on one side and I want to create additional windows on this other side. And it will nicely, um, it, will, it will draw directly on a plane and I can snap and um, use inferencing there to make sure that those windows are going to align with the windows that I already placed on the other, on the other side of my building. And here I just used an array tool to quickly um, create multiple windows here. And I can select one of these faces and push and pull it. I can also select them all at once with a tab select and it recognizes like shapes on the same face. And I just extruded them all back six inches together there. And I can of course edit a little bit more. Maybe there's an entrance at that point. Um, maybe there's a drop off or delivery point here. So I'm gonna maybe deepen the, the inset and sort of remove that um, the ledge at the bottom there so that it's more of a delivery or drive up sort of a site. Um, now this there's format ships with various a uh, materials library. Uh, you can also create your own materials from scratch with image um, adding images and textures, transparency, and all those materials will come into Revit. What I'm doing here is something I want to explore as part of my my model is the idea of putting some um, photovoltaic panels on top of my roof to understand um, the feasibility of getting some um, solar energy from my site. So here I'm just doing a quick sort of extrusion to create a schematic sort of a frame for my PV panels. So I created a solid and again I offset some geometry and just push that through to create a void sort of a frame there. And I'm also going to create a group here and put this all inside of a group and the group does a couple things first it keeps it from joining to the other geometry so in this case it's not joining to the roof below it and i want i want that scenario of not joining because i want to be able to move this around separately from the roof element and i can also array it array this group across my roof and create many instances of the same group and of course just like a revit group um, once I have one instance and I edit one instance, the, the edit will propagate to all of the instances of the group. So that's really the power of, um, of grouping and then arraying, which is what I'm going to show here. And I can also make, with a, in the right-click menu, I can make a group unique. So let's say one instance of the group, I no longer want it to, um, to match the other, the other instances, I can make that unique. And I do like to use layers. So I use layers here for visibility a lot. And I'm gonna put these solar panels on one layer and I'm gonna turn that layer off. And then I'm gonna turn on a different um, design option that I have for solar panels that are oriented slightly differently on this, on this roof. And the last thing I'm gonna do is explore a little bit of a design for um, one side of this building. This is actually the side that's gonna face the pedestrian plaza. And I'm gonna add a little bit more detail here. I know that um, it's kind of the feature facade of this building. And so I wanna add some more curtain wall. I wanna add some more sort of um, visual interest to this facade. So I'm gonna use again, some grouping and arraying tools and use materials there again to sort of indicate large swaths of curtain wall. I, in this case, I'm not drawing every mullion and every, um, every edge. I'm just creating again, a, like a massing study, a conceptual massing study 
for this building. So that gives you, again, a general overview of the 3D sketching tools inside of Formit. And um, next, I am going to hand it back to David to do a, do another poll before we get into analyzing some parts of this building. Great, thank you, Heather, uh, and thanks for the run through. So we're gonna launch our next poll here. And the question we are going to poll you on is, what software do you currently use for conceptual modeling in architecture? Uh, and we have some options here. Uh, we're sure some of you use hand sketching as well to go with this, but we're, we're interested specifically in what you're using uh, from a software perspective. So the options are Formit, SketchUp, Rhino and Grasshopper, Revit's conceptual massing tools or other. All right, and it looks like we've got a lot of folks who are using uh, multiple software, which is great. We've got a lot of SketchUp users, we've got a few, uh, a few Revit users as well. Um, so thank you, we appreciate the feedback. It seems like, uh, you know, we'd, we'd love you to, to start using Format as well. And maybe this, this webinar can help you um, in, in terms of realizing the capabilities there. Uh, so thank you for that, and I'm going to pass it back to Heather now as we get into um, a look at insight and energy and solar analysis. Great. Thanks, David. And yeah, so I see it's nice to see people using uh, Revit's conceptual massing tools as well. Um, I'm very familiar with those. I think Formit has a, is a nice intuitive tool to use, so if you haven't tried it out, definitely check it out, and I hope that we help convince you that it's a it's a great tool as part of the collections. So the next segment I'm gonna talk about is ways of analyzing my building. And I'm gonna show you three different ways to analyze. I'm gonna do a sun and shadow study, and then I'm gonna look at solar analysis. And then I'm gonna show you an insight energy analysis report. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But first I'm gonna do some sun and shadow studies. So one thing I want to understand is this um, open space on my site is something I'm, I'm hoping to use as a pedestrian plaza. So I want to understand the impact of the, the sun and shadows of existing buildings on my site. So up here right next to the location button, I'm going to turn on shadows and the sun editor. And I could, could also change the day of year here just with a slider and bring it, say, just over to like May, June, so one of the longer days of the year. The other thing I'm gonna do is um, two things. I'm gonna go back over into my visual styles here, and this is more just because I like to bump up the intensity of the shadows just if I'm, because I'm trying to look at them um, specifically. And then I'm also gonna turn off the work plane grid for that, for, and then, um, and actually there's one other thing I'm gonna do, and that is see how I, when I mouse over this, the um, the FBX is turning blue. Sometimes for presentation, I like to turn that off by turn off pre-selection highlight, and then it just makes it easier for me to navigate my model without that flashing. So from here, so this is a live, um, a live sun study. So I can drag my sun across the sky here and see how my pedestrian plaza looks at different times of the day. So you can see by late morning, it's getting a good amount of sun here. And then I can go all the way over to the evening. So let's see, like late afternoon, early evening, it's going to be fully in the shade. And this is again um, in, say, I think it was May that I picked. So I can go back up, up to my sun change. Let's try to look at um, December, sort of one of the, the days when the sun is at a lower altitude and see what the impact is on my site. So here I'm at the sort of end of my day. I'm going to go backwards in time through. Um, through afternoon to midday and back. And what I'm noticing here is that my site is in shadow a lot of the time here. So I might wanna consider different orientations for my building, especially since you know Denver definitely gets a lot of sunlight all year round, but in the winter it's gonna be cold. So if it's um, in shadow, this may not be the best location for a pedestrian plaza. I may wanna consider reorienting my building. But this gives me great information really early on. All I've done is create a few massing studies and I already have this information. Um, the next thing I'm gonna look at is the solar analysis. So another thing I'm interested in here is understanding, first of all, first off, the feasibility of um, doing photovoltaic 
photovoltaic panels on my roof. And then I also want to look at the um, the sort of the these large swaths of curtain wall and to understand um, is it going to be you know too much solar heat gain coming in? Is there is that going to be an issue? For the so I'm just picking various surfaces up here. I can be more specific and like and pick my my photovoltaic panels if I want, but I also can just pick that roof um, as well. And I'm going to click analyze here. And in this case, I it's um, the range is for the peak for the month that I picked the month of June. So what it's going to do is it's going to show me the the solar intensity in the month of June, and it's in BTUs per square foot right now. And this key tells me the um, color coding where so yellow is a pretty intense intense amount of um, of heat gain up here. And it's going to get a lot of light, which I think means it could be a good candidate for a location for my photovoltaic panels. Now I can see, um, I can also, if I stop at one location, I can see a specific readout for this location, which is saying 151.6 BTUs per square foot um, on my on my curtain wall panels here. And I'm going to say, okay, instead of June, maybe I want to look at December. And I can see here that in December, the there's not as much solar gain up here on the roof, and there's um, a lot less coming in my windows here. And I think what this does is it gives me a great um, place to start a conversation with my systems engineer, right? My MEP engineer, maybe my energy consultant, so I can start to make informed decisions earlier on in my design process. And I can also switch between month peak and also cumulative year here. That's another way I can study this. Okay, so I'm going to close out of that and talk to you a little bit about generating insight. So you might know of um, insight energy analysis because you can also generate an insight um, web report through Revit um, as well. And it's doing the same thing, but through format in this case. And I'm going to, there are a few things I want to do to set up um, my model before I click on generate insight. And one of those things is, that I want to isolate the model, the specific parts of the model that I want to study. So in this case, I have my site context on a layer here, and I'm just going to turn off the site context because I don't need it to evaluate the, all of the um, buildings around my site. The second thing I need is solid modeling within my, my uh, format model. And I know that I had that because we just talked about 3D sketching. And the third thing I need are levels which you see as these blue lines here, and I need those applied specifically to parts of my building. So over here on the right-hand side, I have a levels tool, and I can create more levels or delete levels. I can change the elevations of the existing levels that I already have put in here. And then when I select an element, um, in this case, I'm selecting this, this group here, and I look at its properties, again, over here on the right-hand panel, you'll see that there's a button here called use levels. And so I want to ensure that I've checked that and that levels are in fact applied to this um, space. Because if I haven't, if I don't have that checked and I generate insight, it will, the, the insight will fail. It will tell, it will prompt me and say you need uh, levels applied. So I click generate insight here. And when the insight is done, the view insight button will become active. So I already have an uh, insight started and I'm going to open that now. Um, so if I didn't have it started, it would take me probably 10 to 20 minutes, I would say, generally to generate an insight, this web page for this building. And because I'm logged in again, it will email me when that's ready for, to, um, for me to look at. So when I open up my insight energy, again, it's a web report, it's just a web page, and I'm logged in, that's how it knows that these are the models that I've, I've sent. You can also share models between coworkers. A few settings I want to bring your attention to. I can switch between imperial and metric. I can switch between annual cost and um, energy use intensity or EUI. Um, and I can add specific utility rates. If I know, say, the specific utility rates, gas and electric of Denver, I could add them here. Otherwise, it will use some default utility rates for me. And before I go in and look at what's in this report, 
Um, it does connect directly to um, the 2030 commitment. So if I click on this, I can say report to AIA design data exchange, and that will send this report directly to, oh, I'm not logged in. So you do need to have, you need to be, um, you need to have a key for your company and for your a user profile. And then this, um, you'll be able to generate that report and send it directly to the AIA. Now, I can also click here, and this is going to open up the um, the model that I just sent to to Insight. And so you'll see in the upper left here is this readout that says 67, and this is going to generate a model in this space here. So that 67 is the energy use intensity of my model, and that's just giving me a baseline number to start with and you'll see it's giving me benchmarks here of ASHRAE 90.1 so I'm well under the 130 benchmark of ASHRAE um, but I'm also significantly higher than the architecture 2030 benchmark which is 21.7 and again that's kbtus per square foot per year um, I will so we will in the handout also give you a lot more information about this page but know that what it's doing is it's creating these little cards here, and these cards are all different variables that you can change that will affect this, this energy use intensity rating. And I'm gonna go through a couple of those with you today. Um, and before I, I start with those, you know, so Informit, you know, we didn't, we didn't determine, we didn't give it any kind of like HVAC system, right? We didn't um, tell it what type of walls we're using, so it doesn't know about the insulation or our values of those walls, and we didn't give it any type of um, any, any type of um, percent glazing. But what the insight did is it gave it a default sort of a rating. So if I click, for example, on HVAC here, you'll see that it this triangle is is saying this is the default that we're choosing for this model. But I can change that setting. Let's say I can commit to maybe an ASHRAE heat pump or a high efficiency heat pump, I can pull this range in and I can see that those numbers are gonna cause my energy use intensity to be lower. So with that, I just lowered my EUI to about 45, right? It was originally up at 67. So again, you just like flip this card over and see those readouts. Um, I can do the same, I could look at roof construction. So again, it's choosing this rating over here of, of, of pretty much no insulation. So let's say, well, I think I think my client can definitely, you know, commit to say R19 at least. That brings it, it's going to bring it down a little bit further. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm not going to go over all of these, but another thing I want to show is, um, so like say, say let's let's take a look at the um, the northern walls. So this is the side actually that the pedestrian plaza is on. It's saying that my current window to wall ratio. Is, is a large range here. Um, but maybe I, I can say, well, I know that I want to put a lot of curtain wall in here. So let's say I, I need to, I'm committing to say 65 to 85% glazing. Um, and I can narrow that range down. You'll notice because this line here is quite horizontal, there's not a huge impact of the percent glazing is not impacting my energy use intensity that greatly across the use of this building. But anyway, it's good to know that I can change those and set those. And again, I can scroll down. I can look more specifically at the photovoltaic panel efficiency payback limit and all of that. So again, I think the insight gives me as a, as a design architect a great tool to start to um, have a conversation with my, with my energy consultant or my systems team or my systems consultants. And it also gives me some great tools really early on to start understanding um, and making decisions about my building based on energy, solar analysis, um, and sun and shadow studies really upfront. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to David to do another poll. Thank you, Heather, and thanks for the walkthrough. Um, we're gonna launch our third poll here, and the question is, what types of analysis are most important to you during early stage design? And your options 
are, please select all that apply, sun and shadow studies, solar analysis, energy analysis, voltage PV potential, photovoltaic potential, or other. As those are coming in, I uh, want to remind you, we've had a number of questions come in about whether there will be a recording of this webinar. The answer to that is yes, it will be sent out uh very soon after the end of this webinar um no later than tomorrow from what i understand so it looks like the questions are still coming in here so we've got a lot of folks who are using it for sun and shadow studies uh we've got about half of the folks on the call are using it are, are looking at energy analysis in uh early stage design uh, and then we've got some other folks looking at pv potential so that's good information um and now to sort of wrap up our presentation i'm going to pass it back to heather to talk about format and dynamo thanks david it's great to hear people are using all of those tools that um really come come inside of revit for free so it's great i invite you to go check those out after this webinar and see um, how you can use them in your studies um so this last part is about using dynamo inside of format so format and dynamo have had a um, good integration for a long time, but recently we've added some additional enhancements to it. And so what I'm gonna to do today is show you how I can, um, I'm gonna do some design studies of this facade um, using some Dynamo graphs. And first, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, turn off this existing, so I had that on its own layer, so I turned it off, and I'm gonna explore sort of the, the what this facade might look like. And you know, cause it might be important to me to understand what does it look like from this pedestrian plaza? Um, you know, how am I sort of how am I aligning to this to this open face here? So Dynamo is over here on the panel on the right. There's a full Dynamo tab. And if I click on it, so this button up here with the Dynamo logo, I can launch D Dynamo directly right from here and it will um, open up. I can start a blank file and, and be on my way with with Dynamo. But with Format, we also ship with um, several sample Dynamo scripts. So you don't need to start from scratch. You can always start with one of these, edit it, do a save as, something like that. New in the 2021 release that came out in the spring is these scripts that have the arrow next to them. And these are, they use a selection set inside of Format to drive the Dynamo graph. And I'm gonna show you an example of this to start and i have a different script here that i'm going to use we are going to provide you guys with this data set and it will have all of these um, scripts in here as well so to start this i'm going to click on that script and it's going to prompt me to select a building outline and i have this profile here on the ground already selected and i'm just going to hit that and i'm going to finish that and it's going to generate some geometry based on this profile down here. And this profile, I happen to have it inside of a group. It can either be in a group or not in a group either way. It knows that it should be um, using the lines within that to generate the design. So what this did is again, it generated this form here. And if I look on the, the panel here, you can see I have various um, various parameters that I can change about about this this facade shape that I just created. So I can change the wall thickness, I can change the um, vertical offset. So I have it offset starting at 12 feet. So I'm kind of saying, okay, it's going to start at level two. Um, the height seems a little tall to me. So I'm going to change that to 42. And I'm going to rerun the graph. And it's going to go back into the dynamo graph and edit that. Um, the height of this. While this is going, this is not blocking me from continuing to do other things in my model. I can continue modeling, continue rotating, whatever. So you'll see it brought that down to a um, lower level. So maybe I want to look at and see what that looks like from um, the standpoint again of uh, the standpoint of sort of a pedestrian entering this plaza. There we go. Um, so what I'm going to do now is do a quick little walk through through what this is doing inside of Dynamo. Um, so when I select that again, there's another option here to edit the embedded graph. So I'm going to click on that, and what it, what it's going to do is it's starting up Dynamo, and it's going to open the latest version of Dynamo, um, specifically this this script, and it's going to 
do that and, and it's directly linked into the format model, which I will also show you. And while this is opening, I will say, so the, the geometry that comes in from, from Dynamo into format, it will come in as a mesh object. You can, with one click in the right click menu, you can obviously change that to a solid if you want to. So a few things, there are three things I'm gonna point out in here. One is the selection node. So over here on the, the list on the right, there's this um, specific format nodes, and this one is a selection node, which is actually what this one is here. Um, and this just gives me, and the good thing here is you can rename it, and this is sort of the prompt to, um, this is the prompt that will be, be given to you back in the, in the format interface. So, you know, maybe I wanna change that to say, select building profile, say instead. Um, this is what's new in the 2021 version of format. So, you know, we have our, we have our selection nodes set up. These parameters here, these inputs, wall thickness, remember I talked about wall thickness and the vertical offset and the total shell height back in the, in the format interface. So these are the same tools that are in the format interface and that's because they're listed as is input here. And as soon as it's is input and it's brought back, it's baked into the Dynamo file, it comes up in that properties panel. And the other thing I wanted to show you here is, let's say I make a change to the wall thickness that change is going to show up here. So you'll see that that um, the thickness of this wall just changed. So there, there's a live update going on here. And I'm not going to get into the details of the graph itself, but um, we'll, we'll give you links to that in the handout. But note that at the end of this is a baked deformant node, and that's going to drive the geometry back into format, it, again, as that mesh object. And I'm going to just close this I'm not going to save and it's warning me that the save I made so for example like the four foot um, wall thickness changed back to one fix I didn't save it that's okay for, for now um, so now that I sort of understand a little bit about how this graph is working I've generated a few different options here and I put them on different layers so maybe with this one I'll, I'll put this on the um, facade option two layer and then I'm gonna turn that off and just scroll through a few other options that I have here. So I have this, um, just a simple curve. I have sort of a, a more of a swaying curve sort of directly on this plaza. And I have sort of more of a sail sort of theme here. And again, so this is a great way for me to start to evaluate these different design options. And the other thing that I really like about the format and Dynamo workflow is that as a design architect who's working in format, I can still have complete control over what's happening with this Dynamo graph. And I can do that all within the interface of format. So while I'm, I'm taking advantage of the power of computational design and working with my design technologist who might make that graph for me, I end up with full design control back in the format model. And I think that's, that's important to a lot of designers. The last thing I'm gonna do is show you another version of this model. So flash forward, oh, and I just, um, you know, when that happens, if you zoom in or out too far, I just hit ZA to zoom all, and then I go and I zoom back in here. So this is taking that model to the next level. So what I've shown you so far in this, in this uh, webinar is really sort of like level of development or LOD 100, right? And I'm showing like a lot of information, uh, a lot of great analysis I can get out of just a really simple LOD 100 model. But, you know, Formit can take it much further and you do have that ability to um, take it into LOD 200, 250 in this case. So we've developed the pedestrian plaza, added a lot more detail and materials to this existing building. Um, and what I want to show you is that within here, we're still using the same dynamo graph to, uh, and I want to turn this back on because I need to see my, my uh, sketch here. This, this profile here is just like that profile that I was using in my, in my um, more, more massing study model. And it's just, it's driving the, the, the shape of this facade. All these pieces of the facade are actually dynamo scripts. So if I select, say, this, this ledge here, you'll see it's driven by, the dyna, by a dynamo script. This um, 
curtain system, it's all driven by a Dynamo script. So if I was to, again, just go in and edit this, um, this shape and then rerun those scripts, I'm gonna have the same design options that I had in my LOD 100 model. So again, I think this is just a great example of how you can work simply and quickly and get a lot of great analysis information, or you can take it to the next level with um, much more detail in your format model. Um, and that concludes the teaching segment of the web webinar. Um, so I started by showing you how to set up your model by defining a location and adding 3D context to your, as, a, as a site. Uh, and I gave a short or overview of the 3D sketching tools inside of Formit. Um, and then once we had that simple massing study, we applied sun and shadow studies, solar analysis, and of course the insight analysis report. Um, and remember it was all generated from that simple massing model. I didn't have to spend days um, modeling details um, to understand various site and weather impacts on my design. I did it pretty quickly. Um, and finally, I showed you how to combine the ease of direct modeling with the power of computational design and Dynamo. Um, so you as the designer can work hand in hand with your technologist and use Dynamo uh, to generate options, but still maintain that creative control over your model. Um, you know, I think using these workflows alongside the other uh, tools in the collection that you're already using is a great way to sort of expand your services and do some perform better informed design earlier on in the process. Um, and with that, I'm going to see, I'm going to switch slides here. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. And I'm going to hand it back to, to David to um, give a summary. Yeah, thank you, everyone, um, and thank you, Heather. Uh, we, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we want to leave time for question and answer. Um, I'm going to start by launching uh, one more poll, and, and that poll is about are you using computational design uh, in your early stage design processes? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It looks like we've done another one here. Um, looks like we've got two going. Are you using computational design in your early stage design workflows? Uh, please indicate the tools that you're using, Dynamo, Rhino and Grasshopper, traditional coding, uh, other, or you don't use computation in early stage design. And it seems like a lot of folks are not currently using computation in early stage design. So I want to emphasize that uh, in our handout as part of this webinar, uh, we have some good tutorials and some good resources that you can use to get started with computational design. Uh, in your early stage design processes, we see the value as being able to rapidly iterate um, and to and to sort of work with complex geometries and format. Um, so I think there's some real opportunity there, and uh, you know we we're here to support you on your journey. So with that, I want to flag some questions and and put these to Heather. And uh, a, a number of you were asking about sort of the differences between Revit's conceptual massing capabilities and between format. So maybe Heather, you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, you know, I used to work on Rever for a long time and I worked on the conceptual massing tools and those massing tools are, are also a great way to do, um, do studies and also get into more complex geometry. I will say that the format interface is a lot simpler to kind of get comfortable with and jump into as a sort of a new a new model a new if you're new to 3D modeling, it also has a lot more of an intuitive workflow. And again, it's a solid modeler, so it's um, really easy just to extrude things and push pull and use them um, use them both as additive and subtractive sort of design methods. Um, the conceptual massing tools as well as format really. You can do the same things in Revit um, once you bring the format model into Revit as you do with conceptual massing tools inside of Revit. By And what I mean by that is you can apply mass floors, so you, you can tag masses and mass floors and start to schedule um, elements by usage or by square footage. And you can also then start to apply, um, I call them the by-face tools, the uh, wall-by-face, floor-by-face, roof-by-face tools inside of Revit. You can apply them to both elements that are coming in from Formit 
as well as elements that are that are that you you generated inside of Revit's conceptual massing model. So I think with I think Formit is just a as a more intuitive, easy environment. You can really start simple and add complexity as you move on. I think with starting in Revit's conceptual massing environment is a little bit more um, sort of starting starting with a little bit more of a complex um, method right up front. Thanks for that, Heather. A uh, couple more questions we want to get to, but first, uh, one more poll question. Um, and this question is about whether or not you are interested in speaking with Autodesk about the AEC collection or any of the solutions that you have heard about today. Uh, and the options are, let me go ahead and launch this. Uh, yes, contact me about a new subscription or adding seats. Yes, I am an enterprise customer. How do I access? Maybe I'd like to speak to a technical specialist. Maybe I'd like to speak to someone to get more information or no, and no pressure. Um, we appreciate you all attending and uh, allowing us to, to tell you about Format and the AC collection today. Uh, I want to get to a couple more questions because I think we had time. Um, one of the questions that came in that I think I'm going to throw to my colleague Scott is if you're interested in Formit and you know you're, you want to get your team interested or you're, you're trying to sort of talk about Formit with your team and, and sort of encourage the adoption there, what kind of strategy would you recommend or what kind of options does Autodesk provide, Scott? Sure, yeah, I can start with that one. So uh, I run into this a lot in my role at Autodesk. I'm one of our senior AEC technical specialists. I'm out in front of customers all the time and I find a lot that look at Formit and want to start moving over. The first thing I would say to consider, just like making a decision to move from one software package to any other software package, is just remember, they're they're not the same. I mean, yes, there are similarities between Formit and SketchUp, but I find the, the firms tend to fail where they start trying to compare every single feature in SketchUp with every single feature in Formit. SketchUp can do some things great, but on the Formit side, we think we can do some things uh, really, really uh, well, and especially around interoperability. You've heard a lot about that today working with InfraWorks and bringing in that information in format and getting that information into Revit. So a much more seamless process there. So that's kind of my first thing is it, the days when you were in AutoCAD and moving to Revit, you had to think it's not the same program any longer. So just keep that in mind when you're adopting format. Then secondly, it's really just about having a plan in place and having your upper leadership have support in that plan. If you really are truly wanting to move from a SketchUp-based environment to a format-based environment, have a plan in place and have a strategy about that set up a pilot project with the team, get some implementation support from either Autodesk, from technical specialists like me, or from your resale partners that you work with, and they can help make sure that you've got format set up, you've got the environment correct, uh, you've got the, you know, basically everything ready to go, you can start that pilot project, and you'll see that it'll start really start to expand within your firm from there as you start to get pilot projects up and running, others see how well format works, with things like Inforks and Revit again, and that, that much more seamless process of getting that information into uh, Revit as the much more powerful documentation tool, or even doing things like rendering and, and further energy analysis studies, and obviously getting your construction documentation done. So I'll say that, you know, it's, it's again, remembering that it's not the same program, putting a plan in place, having a strategy, going through a pilot project, and then, you know, following through on all of your, all of your plans that you had made to, to make the transition. Excellent. Thank you for that, Scott. And that's a great perspective. Oh. The, uh, so that concludes our webinar for today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. And just another reminder that this was the first in our AEC Essentials webinar series. So please go to the link autodesk.com slash AEC slash webinars and register for some of our upcoming, uh, upcoming presentations. We've got some really good stuff on, on tap, uh, including uh, bridge design workflows coming in August. And in September, we'll be looking at generative design in Revit. So really exciting stuff. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you to Heather. Thank you to Josh. Thank you to Scott. Uh, and I think we'll wrap with that. Yeah, thank you guys. And go check out Format and check out the handout and the uh, supporting material. But yeah, I hope you find it a great tool. Thanks for attending.